Since this series is about movie experiences, and a big part of the experience for me was the lead-up to the movie coming out, I want to talk more about that lead-up, where I picked out movies for a double feature. Half a bottle is better than none. There's something I really like about pairing two movies together for a double feature. I guess it's sort of like the movie equivalent of a mixtape, just with two really long songs. The first movie I picked was Dark of the Sun from 1968. I found this copy at the used bookstore. I hadn't even heard of this movie, but I was captivated by the fantastic cover art. The cast caught my eye too. Rod Taylor and Yvette Mamieu previously starred together in a movie I'm quite fond of, The Time Machine from 1960. And I'm not a sports guy at all, but I really like Jim Brown as an actor. When I saw the trailer for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where it shows clips of some of the things that Rick Dalton has been in, including the movie where he kills Nazis with a flamethrower. I love that stuff, you know, the killing. A lot of killing. Anybody order fried sauerkraut? It just made me think, Dark of the Sun seems like the type of movie that Rick Dalton would be in. That was a smooth lead. Thank you. Cover me! There's a Nazi. Put the swastika back on. What? the swastika back on. There's not a flamethrower, but there is a chainsaw. I have no idea if I'm right about it being the type of movie that Rick would be in, but there at least turned out to be a Rod Taylor connection. The fictional movie that Rick is in, The 14 Fists of McCluskey, stars Rod Taylor. You can see him on screen very briefly in the scene where Pacino's character is watching the movie in his Rick Dalton double feature. I open up a box out of bourbon. I light up, I pour myself a cognac, and I watch the 14 fists of McCluskey. What a picture. What a picture. Good, good picture, yeah. That is so much fun. Tarantino also spoke a little bit about the fictional Rick Dalton movie on an episode of the Pure Cinema podcast. He has a bunch of guys on a mission movie in uh, his filmography called uh, The 14 Fist of McCluskey. It's the official podcast of the New Beverly Cinema, the movie theater Tarantino is a partial owner of, and he's a guest on it once in a while. So in my movie, Rod Taylor would have been McCluskey, so he's like the star. Mm. Uh, Verna Lisi would be the beautiful Italian partisan that like joins mm -hmm. them. Uh, Rick Dalton is like the number two guy, you know, the second lieutenant. When I picked out Dark of the Sun for my double feature, I had no idea there was a Tarantino connection. But it turns out he's a pretty big fan of the movie. It's what he calls a bunch of guys on a mission war movie. His introduction to the movie was also cover art. He had found the soundtrack on vinyl and was captivated by the art on the cover, which is also fantastic. It kind of reminds me of the box art on the sets of classic Army Men that I think my Uncle Martin used to give me when I was a kid. After getting the soundtrack, Tarantino ended up getting a film print as well. He screened the film during the 5th Quentin Tarantino Film Festival, also known as QT5, at the Alamo Draft House in 2001. During those festivals, he screened film prints from his own private collection. According to an article on Ain't It Cool News, he was apparently quite complimentary of the film before and after the screening. He had wanted to screen the film at prior festivals, but could previously only find versions of the film that had been edited for television. This would have been around the time he was originally writing his own A Bunch of Guys on a Mission War movie in the late 90s, which eventually became Inglorious Bastards. When I bought Dark of the Sun and picked it out for my double feature, I hadn't read the back of the DVD case, which actually mentions Tarantino in his World War II film. Quentin Tarantino would offer a tribute of sorts to this red-blooded wallop of a cult fave by using part of its compelling score in Inglorious Bastards. 
Three different cues, including the main theme for Dark of the Sun, were used in Inglorious Bastards. There was also a Rod Taylor cameo in that film. Considering how much Tarantino loves Dark of the Sun, he probably would have released it on home media, with his short-lived vanity label distribution company, Rolling Thunder Pictures. Hi, I'm Quentin Tarantino, and I'm here to introduce the Rolling Thunder video collection that we'll be releasing through Buena Vista Home Video. I love this promotional video with its hip, kinetic 1990s editing and its Dutch angles. Has anyone ever come up with a name for that style? Why are our films doing great on video? Why? They're movies that you can see again and again and again. The Rolling Thunder Pictures video collection focused on cult films and foreign films that weren't easily accessible in the United States. People will, who will be discovering the films, they're infectious. They'll watch it once, all right? Then they'll go and they'll rent it again to uh, show it to their buddy. It was way before my time as a movie collector, but I wish the Rolling Thunder Pictures video collection had lasted longer. After only a handful of releases, the vanity label was unfortunately shut down by its parent company Miramax in the late 90s due to poor sales. Quentin Tarantino's Rolling Thunder Video Collection. Don't miss out on the action. I don't know if I'm right that Rolling Thunder would have released Dark of the Sun, but fortunately another company did instead. I have the 2011 remastered release by the Warner Archive Collection. I have some other Warner Archive releases and I'm quite appreciative of their work. A lot of the movie does kind of have that feel of playing with plastic army men as a kid. Just more dark and disturbing. The score is fantastic. It's haunting in parts. In other parts it's weirdly playful with this bouncy shuffle beat. The music gives the movie so much of its character. I can understand why Tarantino used some of it for Inglorious Bastards. Wow. The cinematography is also great. There are all these shots of mountain and jungle landscapes and the steam train. sped up or undercranked footage that feels awkward. I know undercranking was pretty common in older movies. I usually enjoy seeing dated techniques in older movies, even when they don't look realistic. Stop motion, miniatures, matte paintings, rear screen projection. Undercranking has been used really creatively, but most of the time it just feels like a bad attempt to make dull action more exciting. And this movie just really didn't need it. There are some really incredible stunts, especially stunt driving, that are legitimately exciting and look dangerous. I really like the performances by the three main actors. For such a brutal and violent movie, there are all these little human moments with really good dialogue. They kind of come out of nowhere, but they're not unwelcome. Curry's a hard guy to be away from. He's a hard guy to be with sometimes, too. Between us, he's tough and he's mean, and he won't give you that little extra part of himself that you need. And that hurts. So what do you do? Hurt. How come you didn't say you love me back? Okay, fine. I love you. I love me too. Okay. So, did you call just to tell me you love me? Uh, you're the one who called me. That doesn't sound like me. Have you been drinking? Are you sure? Yes. You're giving me a migraine. I learned it by watching you. Daniels who drink sangria have brains that drink sangria. Alright, I've gotta get going. I'll talk to you again soon. I love you. I love you too.
Perfect man has a rifle. The second movie in my double feature was Targets, also from 1968. It was produced by Roger Corman and written and directed by Peter Bogdanovich. I first read about it in this book I have called Shock Value, which I actually picked up from the same bookstore where I got Dark of the Sun. Shock Value is a very good read. It focuses on horror films and filmmakers from the 60s and 70s, and provides a cultural context for them in this very accessible way. It isn't just your Halloweens or your Texas Chainsaw Massacres either. It talks about stuff I had never heard of before. It's what got me to watch Targets. When I heard what Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was going to be about, it reminded me of Targets. There are a lot of similarities. Targets is a snapshot of the end of an era in Hollywood, and explores two parallel but seemingly disparate story threads. A bitter, aging actor who feels he's at the end of his career and no longer relevant and a young, mysterious man who goes on a killing spree. The two parallel storylines eventually converge. Tell me that doesn't sound a bit like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. All right, what's Abby, the sweet boy, but I'm, you I'm can't trying, possibly me. understand what it feels like to be me. I'm an antique, out of date. There are other similarities as well, especially with characters in each movie driving around Hollywood listening to the same radio station. and the killers referring to people as pigs. Watch your hunt this time. I'm gonna shoot some pigs. Good luck. Okay, pig killers. Let's kill some pigs. I wondered if the similarities were intentional. Something I really appreciate about Tarantino is he isn't coy or cagey about his influences. I enjoy checking out the art that influenced the art I love. It can enhance my appreciation of it. People like Tarantino who talk about their influences make that easy for me. In the lead up to the release of Hollywood, I was paying attention to interviews. And Tarantino talked about several movies that were influences, but he never mentioned targets. I know that Tarantino and Peter Bogdanovich are fans of each other and longtime friends. I read that at one point when Bogdanovich was struggling financially, he moved into Tarantino's guest house. I've also heard Tarantino talk about multiple Bogdanovich films, but never targets. I really wanted to hear Tarantino's thoughts on Targets and find out if Targets was an influence on Hollywood. But I searched and I couldn't find anything anywhere on the internet where he even mentioned Targets. Then in 2020, I found out that Tarantino had started writing reviews for old movies and posting them on the New Beverly website. And one of the movies he reviewed was Targets. Probably never in my life have I been so excited to read a review. I could finally know Tarantino's thoughts on Targets. And his review was a good read. The Pure Cinema podcast did a whole episode about the reviews and had Tarantino on as a guest. Not only do they talk about Targets, but one of the hosts asked Tarantino exactly what I wanted to know. On another level, it seems like it could have been an influence on Once Upon a Time, just in terms of the driving stuff, maybe, the radio stuff. Is that a thing or not really? Well, no, no, it, it's, uh, well, it, it wasn't an influence as far as like when I was doing uh, a Once Upon a Time in, in Hollywood thinking, hey, I'm going to do this like Targets. To actually watch uh, uh, the killer get into his uh, Mustang and just breeze through uh, Los Angeles and like listening to Cage J. You can be yeah. a, uh, I think you hear Robert W. Morgan or uh, Charlie Tuna. Uh, actual the Cage J uh, jingles on there. Like, oh my God, this is, this is very similar. Tarantino even talks about how each movie has parallel but unrelated storylines that eventually converge. But I didn't quite realize how similar it was. I mean, and even to the degree, and this wasn't planned, but it is just what it is, is even to the whole concept that you have um, two parallel storylines that are running their course. One of them, both movies, one of those storylines is following an actor. Ah. In ours, it's Rick Dalton. and theirs, is Byron Orloff, the Boris Karloff character. Then there's a, a competing storyline, part of the Manson family that's out there in, uh, in the world. And in Bogdanovich's movie, it's a Charles Whitman surrogate who's out there in the world. And it's about how eventually you watch the entire movie and these two completely separate storylines that have nothing to do with each other eventually converge. Yeah. And but that wasn't planned. That's just kind of uh, what it was. So thank you to the Pure Cinema Podcast. 
Unfortunately, most of Tarantino's reviews have disappeared from the new Beverly website, including the one for Targets. I have a theory as to why. Why? Tarantino has released a book, the novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Deadline reported in November 2020 that the deal was for two books, the second of which would be cinema speculation. It was described as a deep dive into the movies of the 1970s, a rich mix of essays, reviews, personal writing, and tantalizing what-ifs from one of cinema's most celebrated filmmakers and its most devoted fan. So maybe the reviews disappeared from the website because Tarantino was putting them in the book. I know Targets is from 1968 and cinema speculation focuses on the 1970s, but hopefully that review is part of the book. I'm not gonna get my hopes up though, but either way, the book sounds like something I'd enjoy. Sammy, look around you. The world belongs to the young. Make way for them, let them have it. Targets is an interesting movie. There's a whole interesting backstory to the production that's worth reading about. Tarantino talked a lot about it in his review. It feels like the two parallel story threads just shouldn't work together, but they somehow do. And the juxtaposition is striking and thought-provoking. Throughout the film, the point of view shots, the sound design, and the use of diegetic music in lieu of a film score are all incredibly effective. I describe targets as pivotal, the transition from old horror to new horror. Oh, I know how people think of me these days. Old-fashioned, outmoded. In the context of the movie, those are represented as old Hollywood movie horror versus real-life horror, such as mass murders. Wait a minute, I want to show you something. My kind of horror isn't horror anymore. There they are. Look at that. No one's afraid of a painted monster. The movie is sort of meta. The aging monster movie actor Byron Orlock is played by Boris Karloff, who is most famous for playing Frankenstein's monster. The Orlock character seems to be at least somewhat based on Karloff himself. The director, Peter Bogdanovich, is also in the movie, and also seems to be playing a character somewhat based on himself, a filmmaker named Sammy. He even says a line that I guess Bogdanovich has been known to say. All the good movies have been made. I really like the Sammy character and his dynamic with Orlock. Uh, oh. ah! Have you gone mad? I was having a nightmare. I opened my eyes, the first thing I see is Byron Orlock. Very funny, very funny. Oh. Oh. It makes me think of the movie Ed Wood, specifically Ed's relationship with Bela Lugosi. How dare that asshole bring up Karloff? You think it takes talent to play Frankenstein? It's all on makeup and then grunting. I Bella, I agree 100%. Now, Dracula, that's a role that requires talent. Sammy is sort of in a relationship with Orlok's assistant, Jenny, who is another character I really like. The relationship doesn't seem to be very well defined to either of them. What if he goes back to uh, England? He's always talking about that. Would you go with him? Would you like me to stay? That's up to you. It seems just as much based in convenience and proximity as it is attraction. It's an interesting dynamic, and I enjoy their chemistry. You look worse than he does. I feel worse. There are multiple references to Jenny being Chinese, mainly in dialogue between her and Orlok. So you can just stop being my little oriental conscience. You really are in a foul mood. But there's so much personality to her character beyond just being Chinese, or being Orlok's assistant, or being Sammy's love interest. Why don't you ask Smith for a job? Then you can be with Sammy all the time. It would be easier if my concern were purely selfish, wouldn't it? I really couldn't be less interested. You'd love it if somehow you could convince yourself you'd been betrayed by everyone. Then you'd really be happy. No guilt and full of self-pity. Quite a speech. You ought to hear it in Chinese. Even the killer is interesting. He's basically one of the main characters. And you follow him around, see his day-to-day -day activities. Whether they be more mundane, like sitting down and watching television with his family, or the more unsettling, like 
purchasing ammunition or shooting at drivers. There's a whole tragic mental health aspect to the character that's really interesting, too. I want to talk to you, Eileen. Hmm. What about? Hmm? I don't know what's happening to me. Why? Why get funny ideas? Like what? Targets was incredibly topical when it came out. The killer is based on Charles Whitman, the University of Texas Tower Sniper. And between the time it was filmed and the time it was released, both Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy had been assassinated. With the prevalence of mass shootings in the world, the movie feels just as relevant as it ever was. It's one of the few movies made in the late 60s about a hot button political issue that where that button is just as hot now. I mean, there's nothing dated about the movie at all. I had been feeling particularly disillusioned by gun violence back when I first read about the movie and had the urge to check it out. It felt like there was a mass shooting every week. The film offered no catharsis, no comfort, no answers. But I'm not sure that's what I was expecting out of the experience anyway. All I know is I'm glad I watched it. Have you ever seen Targets or Dark of the Sun? Do you like picking out double features? If so, leave a comment down below to let me know why. Why? Wow. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a good night. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'd like to leave you with a little story to think about as you drive home through the dark.